Where am I? Uh, upstairs at Freilich, show 322, real one. I can't read. I think it's about time we talked about a really off-kilter superhero movie, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Like a, a completely original superhero, when you think about yeah. it. Totally created out of scratch because Sam Raimi could not get the rights to either Batman or The Shadow when he wanted to. What was the other one, too? I forgot. Oh, he wanted to. Uh, he wanted also to. Uh, for some reason, he wanted to do. He was a big Thor fan, and he was also a big um, uh, fan of. Uh, what's the other one? There's another one. I don't know if it was Spider Man yet. But I didn't know, know he got the job. <laughs> he couldn't. I mean, like he couldn't do anything. They wouldn't give him any rights in any way. They wouldn't trust him because he didn't really like make studio pictures. The only experience he had was a really bad one. Yeah, you know. I mean, th- I mean, now one could argue that Crime Wave was, while it was his first studio picture, it was not a real studio picture. You know what I mean? Cause... Well, he had to. I mean, like he had to deal with the same kind of interference that you would ordinarily get from a studio. It's just that he was able to at least shoot in Detroit, right? But they were again interfering the way every studio interferes. Maybe you should do this. Oh, do this. Cast our boy instead of your boy. That kind of stuff. So he had to put up with a whole bunch of. I mean, he put up with it, but it was nowhere near as bad as the bullshit he had to put up with on Crime Wave. Yeah. Um, Nowhere near as bad. Well, no. Well, with Darkman, Darkman is a a situation – I'm really not quite sure. Maybe it was the underground success of Evil Dead 2 that got his foot in the door with Universal. Universal came in and actually put this thing together. They produced and distributed it, but they didn't produce and uh, and distribute uh, Army of Darkness together. They only distributed it. They brought in like because it was Dino, I think it worked. Yeah, that. that it was a it was a half and half thing. It was uh, and Dino, half funded by yeah, right. Dino didn't have a company at that point, right? Not anymore. It was so all over. He was pretty much just independent. So he put together everything for putting together Ar- Army of Darkness. But Universal had a first look deal with Sam Raimi because Darkman was actually profitable. I mean, it was made on a on a small budget comparatively, but it did turn a profit. Maybe they didn't put it in as many theaters. Because of the advertising, the problem was the advertising. I remember Raimi talking about that. He said that Universal didn't know how to market Darkman. So they put out these uh, ads in the newspaper just like Big Trouble in Little China. In Big Trouble in Little China, they had these ads to say, who is Jack Burton? So what they did was they did these newspaper ads to say, who is Darkman? And I, a lot of people didn't know what to make of this, so it was kind of. But a you bad know what? Way to I th- it, it worked though, because it worked for me because I was an eight-year-old kid when it came out, and I remember seeing the trailers, and I was like, I had no idea about Evil Dead or anything like that. I'm just like, this looks so interesting. I can't wait to check this movie out. This was, uh, you know, and then I had, I had to wait for video like everybody else. But. Well, you probably they probably wouldn't have let you see it. Wasn't this R rated? This was R rated, right? Yeah, but even I though had I, ra- it doesn't, I don't understand why it was R rated. This is another movie that doesn't really have it doesn't have any that much in the way of strong language, and it doesn't really have graphic violence. The violence is not as I don't know gory as what you would ordinarily see today, right? No, not really. I think... It's got there skin is, and so there, flesh, but that's about it. Yeah, there is some... Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much just an R rating for the special effects, you know, because Liam Neeson's face and, you know, the gun hits and bad language <clears> and yada, yada, yada. But, you know, dude, it worked in its favor, man. I'd rather take it as an R-rated movie over a PG-13 movie. So we watched it last week. I have it... This is another movie I have on, on uh, Laserdisc. I actually have a Laserdisc of this. And a laser disc of Army of Darkness. I'd love to dig them up, but they're tucked away in the in the in the basement. Just the bare bones uh, MCA home video laser discs. So here's the here's the ironic part. I have the Shout Factory special edition Blu-ray of Darkman, but I only have the sequels on laser disc. Oh yeah, that's right. The sequels were also put out on laser because they were the sequels were direct to video basically, right? Yes, they were all. But they and the cool thing was they were all done. By Sam Raimi's company. They were all done by Renaissance Pictures. Right. You know, so at least even though they changed the lead actor, I mean, obviously Liam Neeson blew up. He's not going to do a straight to video movie. No. That being said, you know, at least there was some care done on the sequels. They were both shot back to back. What kind of sucks is you could tell there are when you watch the second movie and then go into the third there are a lot of carryover repeat shots that they do in the third movie. Oh, really? That and the, th- the third movie has, has a little bit of a plot hole, too. It has, like, this big plot hole that's never resolved. Because, like, so basically, in a nutshell, the second movie is Durant comes back and Peyton Westlake has 
partnered up with a guy to make the artificial skin last longer than 99 minutes. Okay. So, well, but yeah, okay. Go, well, but then first, I'm my, making it. My, yeah. My well, I, I wanted to ask a question because. Now, what happens to Durant at the end of uh, Dark Man, and how does he resurrect himself for the second movie? Exactly, like, dude, nobody could have survived that helicopter crash. <laughs> nobody could have fucking survived that. But then the movie did, like, again, the movie did so well on home video and so well on cable that Universal's like, "Hey, we'll do sequel, but uh, straight to video. You ain't going to theater." Okay, so, so let's talk first let's talk about Liam Neeson the great actor of course the guy is a treasure uh we love him he became he was about to explode right when this movie came out um he had only done I mean like his first uh taste of fame was in kind of cult circles because he appeared in two certified cult movies very early on called Excalibur and Crawl yep and then he appears oh he was also in the bounty which was uh, Mel Gibson and Anthony Hopkins. It was a remake of Mutiny on the Bounty. It was one of Mel Gibson's first big Hollywood movies. Uh, it, it was too big budget. It didn't really make its money back. He, he does all these very small movies, and then he comes back and he does, he does a movie called Suspect, I believe, which Cher, I think? Yeah, sure. that, yeah. I yeah, know about so that movie he was too. in that, right? And, and then he appears in a movie that was directed by uh, Neil Jordan called High Spirits, which is kind of a goofy comedy starring Steve Gutenberg. Uh, Daryl Hannah, I believe, and also Beverly D'Angelo and Peter O'Toole, Jennifer Tilly, Peter Gallagher, and Liam Neeson's all the way at the bottom of the credits there. This is a movie I know of mainly because my wife talks about it occasionally, even though she tells me, she keeps telling me over and over again that she doesn't. Uh, he was also, that year, he was, I believe, the romantic lead for Justine Bateman and Satisfaction. Mm. It was a movie that they were trying to launch Justine Bateman's career because I guess Michael J. Fox was famous. So they were like, okay, let's, let's put Justine Bateman in a movie. And she's in this movie with Julia Roberts and a couple of other people who wind up becoming way more famous than her. And she's <laughs> the star of this movie. So it says it above the title, Justine Bateman. You know, meanwhile, there's Julia Roberts, Liam Neeson. And then, right, okay, what do you remember? Dirty Harry. <sighs> He's in the Deadpool. the Deadpool with a uh, he's got a little uh, ponytail, right? Yep, he's got a ponytail, and so he's he's getting all these kind of like high profile roles in big movies, and then after that, he's in Leonard Nimoy's movie, The Good Mother, right? Well, that one I don't know about. I was I was waiting for you to talk about next of kin. Yeah, yo, we're gonna get to Patrick Swayze because we <laughs> talked about this, and he is Patrick Swayze's brother, uh, and opposite Bill Paxton, who's also <laughs> his brother. They're brothers. And none of them look alike at all. And one of them's not even, he's a guest in our country, for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and then he gets Darkman. And that, that, I guess, maybe that's a signature role for him. But Liam Neeson was always, I mean, it's so bizarre. Before he became a big star, he was in, like, movies that are cult movies. You wanna, but you want to know what, you want to know why Liam Neeson is such a good sport? This is what blew me away. You would not think, with his stature, with his star power, he would want to go back and do interviews on Dark Man. He fucking did. And you know, you know what that is? I mean, he's just like he's he's an Irish act. He's from he's from the UK. They have they take very seriously, no matter how silly the role might be, no matter the fact that he was in the Delta Force, right? Or 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 like all these the kind of like direct to video kind of trashy looking movies that he might have done early on. And then he he has a certain respect for the work. I mean, like he, you know, a lot of actors on the, in this on this side of the pond, if you will, they tend to want to forget those little yeah. movies. Like just uh, Julia Roberts wants everyone to forget about Satisfaction, you know. But he's like, yeah, I did Satisfaction. I did it. I kissed Justine Bateman. I did. <laughs> hey, what do you That's think like, of my Liam Neeson? That's my Liam Neeson. Hey, let's go rustle up some cattle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and then he does, <laughs> he does, uh, uh, he does uh, this uh, movie called Under Suspicion, which is a favorite of mine because it's with Lara Jan San Giacomo, one of the hottest women ever. He has a really hot sex scene with her in that movie. I, I advise all of you to check it out. It's really, it's like, it's like back in the Skinamax days where you could actually do that. They don't do that anymore. I'd, l I would like to firmly believe that fucking whoever the guy was who made take and i don't even re remember his name but i all i can say is luke Besson, robert mark came and they were the ones that wrote the movie i would like to think that they had both watched dark man and said you know what this guy would make a pretty convincing badass i didn't well i'd love to i'd love to think that but 
you gotta also remember taken i mean this was at the height of his popularity so you know you grab but, but that but that the, movie, well right? actually but the thing was though i mean this is liam neeson who a guy before who had only done one big action okay rob roy that's like an epic that is considered an epic I don't care what you say. Rob Roy was kind of the, wasn't it the competition of Braveheart, basically? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and a lot of critics liked Rob Roy, and I like Rob Roy. I think it's a really good movie. But Liam Neeson is one of the last people you would ever suspect to become this badass, gun-toting action hero. You know? Well, and you, again, you, I would, you know what I he would became? like to think. In a way, he became kind of like what Harrison Ford became, you know? Give me back my family. Give me back my family. <laughs> you know that kind of thing. Well, yeah, but then you see, the thing was, Harrison Ford was always an action hero, though. I mean, he was. Starting, that's true. I mean, yeah. He was always an action. Hero. Liam Neeson is, yeah, like we said, because he's across the pond. He's in the UK. He's like a, he, he could be like a Shakespearean kind of a dude. You know, he could get up there with a skull and say, "Alas, poor York, I knew him." You know that. Kind and of then, thing. and then at the same time, he could rip the skull clean out of your head. Yeah, he's like, but he is a. <laughs> let me tell you something. My wife has an absolute like love affair with this man she absolutely is in love with liam neeson no matter what he does she loves his face she loves his look she loves his voice so anything he can do no wrong for her yeah, except when he's making dumb comments on national tv that he shouldn't have been making <laughs> oh but... uh, when he made his uh, comment about well i mean like he was okay you know what i'm not gonna fault liam for that he was being honest he was actually being And honest. I give him some credit i he, mean he and, deserves and... all the credit in the world he's because he's an actor in this business and these people, all they do is lie their fucking socks off. They completely lie. He told the truth. And I got to give him respect for that. He gets props. And, and it eventually, it all it all blew over. You know, everyone. That's because they, we love Liam. We love Liam Neeson. Even as a cool that, name, Liam Neeson, man. That and the movies he makes aren't half bad. Like, dude, The Grey was a badass movie. I love I have, The Grey. I've heard great things about it. I really do want to see it. Oh, I've heard it's really so good. good. So I mean, some of them action movies he's done too. After Taken, some of them are pretty decent. He goes well. well I'm still in the '90s here. He he does he does a Woody Allen movie. He does um, he uh, and then he gets Schindler's List. He becomes he becomes Liam Neeson in all caps with that movie. And he also does a really passable Southern Tennessee doctor accent in Nell. I mean, I really enjoyed him in Nell with his wife, the the late uh, Natasha Richardson, which her death absolutely destroyed him. And that really broke my heart, too, because I felt like he was really in love with her. He was really in love with his wife. Yeah, most people, you know, yeah, they don't bounce back, bounce back from that. Like, look what happened when G with Gene Wilder when uh, Gilda Radner died. He pretty much quit. That's like, right. He was, he was done. And then Rick Moranis, you know, same thing. When his wife passed away... And he was left with his kids. He goes, I'm done. I'm just going to yeah. walk away. My you know, but then you know, Liam Neeson and, and, and John, to a lesser extent, even John Travolta for saying that poor man, John Travolta, he's gotten it twice. I know. You I know, know, he lost, he lost his son bad, and his daughter. And he's fortune, still yeah. working. He's still and, working. And let me tell you, I am looking at his, at his filmography. This is such an incredible filmography. He has... You know, he did Michael Collins, again, working for Neil Jordan. He did uh, Les Miserables. He did, uh, of course, Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. He was Qui-Gon, for crying out loud. He he did Gangs of fucking New York. Yes. He did, uh, you know, he's not, he's only in it for the beginning, but he's really great. He did Batman Begins. And then he did, uh, he did the voice of the lion, Aslan, you know, in the Chronicles of Narnia movies. And then he goes on and does Taken. And and he plays Zeus in Clash of the Titans, and then for some, I don't know how this happens, but Seth Green manages to grab him for a million ways to die in the West, which is just awesome. You know, and and also he was a t he was in Ted too. I mean, apparently, I mean, even though they make they kind of make fun of him in a Family Guy episode, and he does the voice, it's like you were saying, this guy has a great sense of humor about himself. And from, you, what heard, from what I heard, from what I heard, though, he'll do it. From what I heard, though, he loves Seth MacFarlane. And like, and I bet you Seth wanted, loves him, man. Yeah, and it was just like he wanted to do Once Upon a Time in, in the West, or what is it, a Million Ways to Die in the West? And he goes, "Okay, but I don't want to do a fake accent. I just want to play it Irish." And Seth's like, "Go for it, dude." Yeah, and it was like he, he didn't even mind that you know Charlize Theron beats the shit out of him and then puts a flower in his ass, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he says, she says to him, she says to Seth later, she's like, "What happened when you confront?" And she's like, "I put a I put a daffodil in his ass." I was like, "Okay." <laughs> That awesome. that, and that's another movie I think is criminally underrated. I know a lot of people. I laughed my ass that off watching movie. that, but I that is seriously one I of the funnier movies. I love that fucking movie, dude. That movie's so good. I mean, I like Ted. Uh, not not as big a fan of, of Ted 2, but I loved A Million Ways to Die in the West. It was fantastic. 
I think a lot of people, though, that, that I think their problem with that movie was Seth MacFarlane in the lead. Like, Maybe, that was their yeah. big issue. I don't know. You, you know, he writes it with his own voice, so it's easier for him to kind of play the character. He's just playing himself, basically. He just wrote I himself. know, but you see, I get, the, I get the gag of the movie, but I guess for authenticity's sake... Okay, we take Seth MacFarlane, who sounds like you or me or anybody else, and he's talking like a guy from the 2000s in the 1800s. Yeah, he just sort of... It's like Brian. He's like Brian in the 2000s. Yeah, it's, it's like his voice, while he has a gift for... Like, his natural voice... Is just so monotone. Like, he sounds like he should be doing fucking radio broadcasts, for Christ's sake. Yeah. You know, a guy with that, like, I honestly think the movie could have been better, you know, if he was the writer, was the director, but he gave it to somebody else to play the lead. Well, I was thinking, okay, like, there's only three movies I can think of where Liam Neeson didn't really use an Irish accent. One was this. Well, I'm sorry, not Darkman. Darkman, he had the Irish accent. You, you just can't hide it. One, well, no, he 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 actually, I always thought he hit it pretty good. I can still movie. hear it. I could still hear a little bit of a brogue. Julie, I'm in love with you, Julie. Jules, <laughs> Jules, come over here. I don't know. He's got kind of a... Julie! <laughs> Julie, it's me. Um, I was thinking, well, Schindler's List, of course, because he had to sound uh, German. And then there was also Nell, where he had to sound like a Tennessee doctor. I think there might have been one more movie. I'm not really sure. T- taken, he tries to do American, but he can't hide the Irish brogue. Listen, do me a favor. Get under the bed. You're going to be abducted. <laughs> you know, uh, Like but, you're going he, to be abducted. Just a wonderful, okay, and and you have you have this movie, Dark Man. I don't know. You know, I mean, Sam Raimi knew Francis McDormand, so all he had to do, because they were roommates for a time, because for some reason, the Coens and, and Francis McDormand and Sam Raimi all had to live in the same house together for some reason. They had no you money. See, we're, ta- we're talking about Liam Neeson, though. It's like, why can't we talk about Larry Drake? <laughs> Larry, the great Larry Jack, who won two Emmys for L.A. Law, a show I never watched because it was for adults, and I didn't really care about lawyers. But yeah, who cares? And we were kids. You know, you were a teenager. I was a prepubescent adolescent. Who, neither yeah, one of us watched L.A. Law. No, that wasn't that wasn't our speed. That wasn't for us. And he he's really great. And it was like some he's the bad guy. He's he's like this mobbed up guy. And uh, he has like this. Uh, he's he's like a kind of a strong arm for this um, for this developer who is looking to, I guess, uh, build uh, an enormous section of that. It's kind of like the cop it's like they kind of lifted the plot of Robocop a little bit, you know? Yeah, because the whole thing centers around a Belisarius memorandum like that's like the whole thing, a memo, basically. That basically shows that this guy paid out Robert Durant to basically be a strong arm. Right. And he didn't. OK, the thing is, Liam is just an innocent guy. This whole thing was meant to get that memo back to retrieve it, possibly kill Francis McDormand. He happens to have the memo in his possession at the lab that he's working on this this formula for skin. He's trying to he's trying to revolutionize. The uh, you know, and help people who have been burned or people who, who might need plastic surgery. So he develops this skin, but unfortunately it's photosensitive and it only lasts for 99 minutes. And that comes into the into play after after he um, quote unquote dies because they come in and they retrieve that memo. They kill his staff. They kill. They they think they killed him. You know, they turn him into like a basically a crispy critter. Yeah, you know, and he's in the hospital. And this whole thing was just about Francis McDormand. I mean, and what's funny enough is that he was literally a victim of something he had nothing to do with because it's like he had he no had idea no what I- any of that was about. He had no idea what the fuck was going on. He's like, like he what are you doing? Scientists trying to create this artificial skin. And all of a sudden, these bad guys come breaking. He's like, what the fuck are you talking about? I got no idea what you want. Yeah, he has no idea. And it's oh my god, you know, I just, I just want to, I can't go on enough about that. Dark. Dark Man is a movie that, you know, I remember. Because I hadn't seen it in years, right? So I pop it in. We watch it uh, last week, and I remembered all the beats, all the clues, all the dialogue, the whole thing with him going psycho every time he hears the word freak. There's like these incredible things. There's a lot of stuff here that kind of reminds me a little bit of, of uh, geez, what, 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 what? What was it? Um, Spider-Man? I think it was Spider-Man. There's like these weird montages that go on. And you see these montages in the first Spider-Man movie where Peter Parker is doing a whole bunch of research into spiders and you see books flying by and, and weird formulas and stuff and spiders going by. Yeah, 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 it's like yeah. This you're kind right, of yeah. old fashioned storytelling, right? And there's this great scene that is so fantastic where Francis McDormand gets the news that her that, that, that her boyfriend is dead, right? And yeah, the morphing when they morphed it. They they dissolve her into widow's clothes. And it's just like, wow, 
This is like some kind of a, a tribute. This isn't, this is not, I don't know if Universal knew what they were getting, but this is actually a tribute to the old Universal horror films. Dark Man could be considered a universal, an old school universal horror film, especially with the techniques they were using. You know, it was all, all of this was like, they were very, I only counted like three or four shots where they used green screens, you know? Right. And there were some matte paintings. You could catch a lot of matte lines in a few places. But overall, for a movie that was done pretty much all practical, it, it's it has an amazing-looking film. Yeah, it's, it has a very low-tech feel to it. You know, it looks like, you know, but no, hardly anything involving computers or anything. anything but then like no filmmaker could ever make another movie like that. It's like, San, like you would not think anybody else, because that's, that's the difference between the two sequels and then the first one, is because you can tell Sam Raimi had nothing to do with that second one. And, and, and also, I mean, it's kind of, well, it's it's also kind of embarrassing in a way for Embassy, because if they had left Sam Raimi alone on Crime Wave, he could have produced a Crime Wave that was on the order of, of Darkman. Just how beautifully everything is put together, you know? But then at the same time, though, they would have had to change the lead actor because, I mean, the lead actor was one of the flaws. I mean, again, we, me and you like the bad guys. Me and you like... The lead actress. We like some of the beats, you know, but fucking that lead actor whose name I don't even care enough to fucking remember. Which one? From Crime Wave? The lead, the lead actor from Crime Wave. Oh, Reed Burney, right. Reed, Reed Burney. I don't give a shit enough about him <laughs> to take his performance seriously. Well, I mean, he's just so, he's so much of a dork. He's just a dork, <laughs> you know? And the thing is, I mean, like, if you put Campbell in there, it's a completely different approach. And it'll probably be a different, a completely different character. And I don't know. I think Liam Neeson was pretty good inspired casting. I mean, at the same time, it would have been cool to see Bruce Campbell play Dark Man. You know, it I would mean, have been cool. This was at a time where Liam Neeson really, I guess, had to make a name for himself or he might have gone back to Ireland or something like that and said, screw it. I'm not going to make American pictures anymore or something. Yeah, because like he was always getting these bit roles. Like it was always a secondary part. Yeah, like, you know, ne like next to Ken or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. And, and it's like he, he looked at it this way. It's like, hey, they're offering me this lead role. And they go, oh, see, he's great. And he probably knew Sam Raimi's work. He probably saw Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2. He probably okay, knew that so he was going to get into, he was going to be, like, tortured. He was going to be beaten. He was going to be sliced up. He was going to be set on fire. He was going to have to jump into a river or something like that, you know. And then it sucks. It's like, dude, it's your lead role, but then, like, 70% of the role, 80% of the role, you're in prosthetics. Yeah, yeah. So a lot but, of times they didn't even have to use Liam if they want to. They could have just used his voice, and it would have been cool that way, too. But it, but it give Liam credit. He instead of phoning it in, he actually got behind the makeup and he did that work. Yeah, yeah. Later to be portrayed by Arnold Vosloo, who uh, I mainly know as the Mummy. He was the Mummy in the two movies. Yeah. Well, uh, the reason the thing is, Sam Raimi actually had a relationship with him because uh, you know the movie Hard Target. Hard Target, which he uh, he produced, right? Didn't he? Right. Arnold Vosloo is in Hard Target along with Lance Hendricks too. Now, Hard Target was directed by John Woo. Yep. And Sam Raimi was one of the first people. Sam Raimi and Quentin Tarantino were two of the first like American filmmakers to bring uh, John Woo out here and make movies. Right. Because of the killer. Was it the killer? Well, yeah, I always thought it was. Uh, you see, that was the whole thing with that was it was Van Damme always tried touting that up because because Van Damme worked really close and he was trying to get all these these, uh, you know, Hong Kong filmmakers to come over here and make American movies because, hey, this is where the money is. and You'll make money over here. You know, because like Van Damme brought John Woo over, he brought Ringo Lamb over, and then he brought uh, Chewie Hawk over. Right. The and guy, and then Chewie Hawk did fucking double team and. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Roseanne Arquette is in Hard Target, right? No, Roseanne Arquette's in Nowhere to Run. Nowhere to Run. Okay, that's the movie I remember. But no, Hard Target's like, uh, oh god. I mean, the chicken it's hot. I just can't can't remember her fucking name right now. Oh, that is uh, Yancey Butler. Yancey Butler. Okay. That, you see, I knew, I kind of knew the name, but it was on the tip of my tongue. So yeah, Yancey Butler. So Sam Raimi was doing some good producing. Arnold Vosloo's a really good, you know, he's a very good, you know, Af South African actor. Uh, oh, fucking Lance Henriksen is in that too. I forgot. I just said Lance Henriksen. <laughs> That's was right. In that yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. He's play he plays that asshole. Uh, Sorry, I'm yeah. an old man. Old man over <laughs> here. Anyway. That's okay. You got fog brain, you know. Oh, wait, you forgot. Remember, you've got Lyme disease. You've got fog brain. Well, I can't use that excuse for everything now, can I? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you use it this time, though, okay? I wanted to 
uh, do the whole crazy cameo of directors and how it started and everything. And I sent you, I sent you some of my notes. Yeah, you sent you sent me the list and how this how is. Many... I wrote an article for We Are Second Union about director cameos in John Landis's movies. Now, some of these directors would then return the favor, and they would return the favor, and then he would return the favor, and then they would return the favor. So it starts with Spies Like Us, which came out in 1986. Evidently, John Landis was a big fan of Evil Dead. And he was a fan of Crime Wave and Blood Simple. So he cast Sam Raimi and Joel Cohen in there with machine guns guarding the Ace Tomato Company, where the two bad guys go to to launch their satellite that will try to start a war with Russia or, or knock out Russia or something like that. William Lustig went and cast Sam Raimi in a little bit part playing a news anchor in Maniac Cop, which starred Bruce Campbell, as we know. Uh, Sam Raimi would return the favor by casting John Landis and William Lustig in Dark Man. In different parts, John Landis has a cameo as a doctor with Jenny Agutter. Yep, Jenny both Agutter. from American Werewolf in London. Because after he is presumed dead, he becomes a John Doe. And he basically becomes, he, he's in this crispy critter thing uh, situation. And he feels no pain because I guess his nerves, were, they had to sever his nerves because otherwise he'd be screaming. So he, that's, that's, one of his, that's one of his powers, if you will, a superpower for Darkman is that he has no pain. Then, okay, what would happen? would be John Landis, Joe Dante, Clive Barker, and Toby Hooper would all appear in Mick Garris's Sleepwalkers in small parts, uh, which uh, I believe came out in 92 or 93. I'm not sure. And then after that, John Landis would cast Sam Raimi in Innocent Blood. And Along then, with Dario Argento. Oh, with Dario Argento, too, right? He's the creepy guy in the ambulance going, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. <laughs> it's like the weirdest mm-hmm. funny. Oh, Frank Oz also. He's a director, technically. And uh, and then Mick Garris would go turn around and cast Sam Raimi and John Landis as bad guys in The Stand in 1994. So there is a weird little circuitous thing going on here. Oh, and then we forgot about... Um... Toby Hooper, who popped up in Coming to America. Toby Hooper would pop up. Okay, yeah, Coming to America, again with John Landis, just casting directors all the time. The biggest movie that he ever did that had the biggest cast of directors, I think, was probably Into the Night, because he had... uh, Oh, I forgot, Larry Cohen also was a cameo in Spies Like Us as well. Larry Cohen, Terry Gilliam, uh, I think Costa Gravas might have appeared in that as well. I'm not really sure. See, Spies Like Us, I've only ever seen the one time, and I saw it years and years and years ago. I thought it was okay. Maybe I need to watch it again. I know a lot I, of people I suggest, love that movie. I suggest you watch it again. It is not only – it's a tribute to the Hope Crosby movies of, of back in the day, but it's also – I mean, Chevy Chase and Jan Aykroyd are wonderful, uh, and it's also just a wonderful movie to watch, along with Into the Night, that has like all these bizarre, out-of-nowhere – uh, director cameos. Uh, these guys used to do that all the time. Uh, I don't know if they're doing it so much these days anymore. No, not really. You don't even catch too many. Like uh, David Cronenberg, didn't, I think he just popped up in something, but I can't really he was in, remember in, what he popped in, up into in. Into the Night. David Cronenberg yeah, but, uh, plays Jeff Goldblum's boss in Into the Night. A oh, year you, know what he po- you know what he popped up in a few years back? Uh, Alias. David Cronenberg popped up in Alias for a couple of episodes. Oh, the TV show. He was yeah, also he, he was also that. the man who who kills Nicole Kidman at the end of To Die For. No shit. Yeah. Hey, spoiler alert! Never That's seen what, that I movie. Mean, well, I, you got to watch it. I mean, he, he's only at the end. He's there uh, 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 under the uh, uh, the false impression that he's there to help Nicole Kidman, but he's actually a hitman. And um, ah. and and I'm watching this movie, and then it comes to the end. I'm like, holy shit! That's David Cronenberg. Also forget, uh, he popped up in Jason X. That's right, yeah. <laughs> little little cerebral party played in Jason X, but it was pretty funny. Yeah. But, but you know, back to Dark, man. Like, for what this movie is... This movie is so much fun. It, this it's, is one it's of, just it's a, such fun a fun fucking movie. movie. It's so fun. And it opened up so many doors for Sam Raimi. It did. After that, he able... He, because of this movie, he was able to get a first look deal with Universal, which is why they went ahead and distributed uh, Army of Darkness. But mainly, I think that was a Dino thing, and I think Dino got most of the money, even though Army of Darkness was not a huge hit. No, but we'll get into that shortly. So, final thoughts on Darkman? Darkman is a movie I absolutely love and adore. I want it on Blu-ray. What did you? You said you had a Shout Factory one. Does that have? Yeah, the, does that have all the bells and whistles on it? Yes, it does. All the bells and whistles. New interviews with uh, Liam Neeson too. That was the big thing. The new Liam Neeson interviews, which I could not believe he did. Sat they interview? Down to do. Did they interview Francis? I can't remember if they did or didn't. 
Francis is also she's a uh, a two time Oscar winner. I forgot to see if we. Uh, I thought she was a three time Oscar winner. I thought she won for uh, what's that new one? Uh, Nomadland. Um, Be- no, because no. She, no. She, oh, but she won as a producer though. She got an Oscar because she produced it for Best Picture. You know, but, I thought she won for actress. I guess I was wrong. But he also. But we have two Oscar winners in this cast. We have Liam Neeson and we have Francis McDormand. Uh, Liam Neeson, I hate to break it to you, home slice, he never won an Oscar. I believe, oh, he was nominated, though. He is an Oscar nominee. He had never won. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he was nominated, but he didn't win, I guess. Maybe they thought Irish was a little too close to German, so never mind. <laughs> well, but then you also have to remember that was the year of Scent of a Jackass. <laughs> you mean, hoo-ha! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of the hoo-ha! So the hoo-ha was going to win that year. I got a beard because I'm working on Carlito's way. And I'm going to be Puerto Rican in five minutes, so I got to go. Anyway, <laughs> that was Pacino. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, wait, no. I lied. It wasn't Scent of a Jackass. It was Philadelphia. That's right. Oh, it was Tom a... Hanks. He's oh, yeah, always Tom funny. H- <laughs> yeah. Fucking Tom Hanks winning for Philadelphia that year. Totally that was Seth MacFarlane making fun of Tom Hanks in Philadelphia. Like, oh yeah, Tom Hanks. He's funny. Everything he says is hits. I, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, wait, wait. Before we move on to Army of uh, Darkness, a couple of words about the sequels. You wanted to talk just a little bit more about. Well, that? like I said, you know, the sequels they are not required viewing, but if you've got three hours to kill and you want to binge them back to back, they're worth watching. Is this I mean, kind of if, like? Is this like uh, like the um, from Dust Till Dawn? Direct the video sequels. No, no, because these sequels are actually good. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> because the original. Now, what sucks is I think it was like even the, and that's what sucks about the from Dust Till Dawn sequels. Robert Rodriguez was actually the producer on them. The third one was actually pretty good. The second one was fucking trash. And that was ironically enough done by Scott Spiegel, who was one of Scott Sam Raimi's Spiegel, buddies. And I believe Bruce Campbell was in them too, right? Yeah, well, Bruce Campbell was in the beginning, and then he fucking died right in the beginning. And then there was also Robert Patrick is in one. Robert of them. Patrick and yeah. Danny Trejo is in all of them, right? Yep, Danny Trejo's in all of them. So, so uh, well, Darkman Two. I just wanted to mention that has Renee O'Connor in the cast, and she was Gabby on Xena Warrior Princess, also produced by Sam Raimi's uh, Renaissance Pictures. Yeah, uh, really, nobody else like popped up in that movie. Like, no futures. Now, what I like about Part Three, you've got Jeff Fahey, the great the Jeff bug. Fahey, the is great in Jeff that. Fahey playing the bad guy in that movie and he actually gets uh, top billing over that one yes he does the only thing is like i said the plot hole in that movie was that he had like peyton ended up having enough skin that was that could sustain itself but he for some mysterious reason he could never create any more so he didn't have any more of that whatever that goo was the goo. yeah because like this is like the whole problem i've had with two and three again you could tell they were thrown together on like a weekend so he meets with a scientist in the second one and this scientist has been making breakthroughs with the liquid skin all of a sudden we carry over to the next movie peyton westlake all of a sudden has this finite amount of liquid skin that he can use on his face to have a real face again yeah, permanent. There was a lot of shit. I will I will tell you this right now. There is a ton of shit that was left on the cutting room floor. Hmm. A lot of stuff that was left on the cutting room floor. Well, they had this, I guess, uh, uh, they had they had a kind of a franchise in place, and they cut, uh, I mean, they, they cut the budget, obviously, but I have no doubt these movies did make money in the home video circuit, because this was at the height of the direct-to-video boom. That was well, on. yeah, they played on, they played on, they had a first when play on When I worked at HBO, video stores, so. we got multiple copies of all these movies i never got around to seeing them though it's unfortunate they're actually the the sequels are decent i mean it's like i'm not gonna go and say oh my god they're highbrow cinematic piece art dude if i could say as what kind of sequels they're they're pretty much like the tremors sequels okay meaning meaning they're actually good sequels for straight to video movies right tremors is another franchise that also lived on in direct to video but you can't say, I mean, you can't really say that, to say, I don't know, the directors, Bradford May and uh, the other, yeah, yeah, Bradford May, that he, he wasn't really, like, replicating or aping uh, Raimi's style or his visual sense. No. No. Like, he was doing his own movie. I mean, I mean like, again, Raimi and... goes, this is rare Raimi. I mean, like, this is a Raimi that is completely, like, this is like Sam Raimi on steroids, the Darkman movie, you know? I always thought you said that the Quick and the Dead was Sam Raimi on steroids. Well, no, I mean the Quick and the Dead, but that that he was he was a gun for hire. 
for that. I mean, like you know, Sharon Stone yeah, brought him true. in. It wasn't anything that he would. He put he put kind of a personal stamp on it, but well, yeah, they that's all what knew. I was gonna say, yeah. They all knew that it was for it was a Sharon Stone. Oh, yeah, you're right. We did talk about that. I mean, but she yeah, was, I, she I, was I the guess, boss. Yeah. She was the boss on that one. I guess you could say Sam Raimi Unchained is pretty much Darkman and our next movie, Army of Darkness. Army of Darkness, which comes out, uh, what, two years after Darkman? Three years, actually. Three? It was actually, here's the thing, man, and I just watched a video on this the other day. Um, due to some legal disputes between Dino De Laurentiis and Universal Pictures, Army of Darkness should have came out in 1992. It was finished. Like, they did, they got it finished in the tail end of 91. They were editing in 92. They were supposed to come out for, a, like, I think either a late summer, early fall release. And due to some contract bullshit, it got put, it got held held back for, like, a couple of, like, six months, I think. Yeah, not, well, not until, yeah, it didn't come out until February of 93. February but, 93. But it did get, in October of 92, it did play at a Spanish film festival. That much information I have here. Okay, so they had a cut. Maybe I don't know. Well, from what and from what I and then like the big other thing about this movie is that there's the four different cuts that exist. There is okay. I have I got one of the last Blu-rays. You remember we were talking about that. I got it off of uh, eBay and it was still in a shrink wrap. I'm really glad I saw it because I, I what I did was I grabbed because we were watching Ash vs Evil Dead, the series on Netflix. Um, and I wanted to show Regan, uh, the Evil Dead movies and Army of Darkness. I grabbed Evil Dead 1 and 2 as a, it was like a two for box set on Blu-ray. Yeah. And I also have that really awesome Anchor Bay DVD of it as well that has both versions of it, plus a whole bunch of other stuff on it too. Um, and then we grabbed this Army of Darkness, which was, which cost me, kind of, it, it did cost me a little bit. I think it was like 40 bucks. Mm. That's about, I think I spent the same on mine, but I got mine, you know, day one. Like, I pre-ordered mine ahead of time. Yeah. And I got, like, the poster and, and all that cool this stuff one that came with it. had almost everything. I mean, it had, it has the TV cut. It has the, uh, another cut. It has an international cut. It has the director's cut, uh, which, uh, which has the alternate ending, and it has the regular theatrical release. Yep. And you get to see them all, and it's incredible to look at. It really is. At the time, it was like the most it, – dude, it's still – that's like the benchmark to how to do – that and Blade Runner are like the two benchmarks on how to like re-release something with every cut available. You know, yeah, And that's, that's pretty badass. Yeah, yeah. Considering – I mean like from what I understood for a long time, Bruce Campbell did not like that – that the original ending they had in mind for it. I always thought he liked that ending, what the ending – I read that he refused to sign copies of it. <laughs> What I thought he per, he preferred the the downbeat, you know, futuristic ending and not the S part ending. Actually, well, I mean, the thing is, you're talking about you're talking about a director and an actor. I think the director is the one who wants the downbeat ending. The actor wants the happy ending. I don't know. Why. Well, and I, from what I understand, Universal wanted the happy ending. Oh, of course, yeah. There's a studio. They want to make money, but this movie went. I mean, it didn't make any. Money. It had an 11 million dollar budget, made 21.5 million dollars at the box office, but this was never going to be a big hit in the theater. It was going to always be a cult movie that would be rediscovered, that it would be re and, and And you know what? It could have done better if, okay, this was another thing I read up on. Universal signed off on it, but they had one thing. They said, we want to distance this from the Evil Dead. Yes, this is going to be a sequel to the Evil Dead 2, but also we want this movie to stand on its own. We don't want people to know that this was a sequel to an Evil Dead movie. That's a weird thing. That's, a, that's that, that right there was stupid. I noticed Why how they wouldn't... marketed it. They marketed it when I saw trailers for it. They put like this um, heavy metal or hard rock thrash sounding music on on the soundtrack for the trailer. Yeah, it was and, a, uh, what is it? Sad but true from Metallica. I remember that trailer. And like, they back they hand. made it they made it look like it was some kind of a a hip horror comedy or something like that. But they were mainly cutting it for comedy. Right. There, there's that bit where where um, where M. Beth, uh, um, the lady there, said, "You once you once found me beautiful," and he says, "Honey, you got real ugly." And yeah. then they played, and then it said Bruce Campbell versus Army of Darkness or something like that. So they, yeah, it, it does seem like the way it was marketed, they were trying to distance themselves from the first two Evil Dead movies. Well, well th is this was... because of rights issues? Because Evil Dead was New Line, and um... no, no, because Dino De Laurentiis had Evil Dead too. That was his movie, so he could do whatever he wanted. 
Right. So, I mean, there, there was no rights as universal. But he wasn't operating they, as a rights holder here. He was just operating as a, um, a financier, right? Well, as a financier, but at the same time, he also had the rights to it because they did the sequel in perpetuity. Universal could have called it freaking Evil Dead 3 Army of Darkness or Army of Darkness Evil Dead 3 or the Evil Dead Army of Darkness, whatever. Universal just didn't want to call it the Evil Dead. I wonder they why. Were, they, they just said they wanted to distance themselves from it. Well, you know, when it came down to it, the first Evil Dead movie was enormously profitable. Uh, the second one, not so much, but developed a cult following over the years that obviously got him this. Uh, it got Universal to agree to distribute this movie. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, but then at the same time, you know, Darkman blew up. And then, I mean, he was he had the script written for Army of Darkness, but, you know, everyone passed on it. Then he did Darkman. Then all of a sudden took it to Dino and Dino got the deal going to you know, split the split the cost between him and Universal, but Universal's like, oh yeah, we don't, we just want to call it this. You know, we don't want to call it Evil Dead Three because, you know, we think this could stand on its own. And, eh. you know, those those big wigs upstairs sometimes they know what they're talking about, but a lot of times they don't know a damn thing. But this was such, I mean, you know, the thing about it. I mean, this is the thing Regan noted, and what we talked about before when we talked about Evil Dead and Evil Dead Two. Evil Dead was like a straight-up horror film. It was meant to be creepy and scary and all that stuff. Uh, somewhat amateurish because very little experience among the cast and crew, right? And then Evil Dead 2 is like this sort of combination where you have a horror movie, you have the elements of a horror movie, but then you have this goofy comedy and slapstick, right? And then we go full-on into comedy with this, with this third movie. And it's my daughter noted the change. She was like, this is like goofy now. It's it stopped being scary and it started being kind of goofy. And Ash is kind of more of a, you know, he's more of the Ash that we tend to recognize now. He's I think they overdo it a little bit with the TV show. The TV show goes a little bit out of its way to make him more of a jackass, you know? Yeah, I mean, they basically, and I agree with you, they turn in the evil, there was the Army of Darkness, they turned him into an oaf. Yeah, but he's still a hero, though. But that's what's great about it is, yeah, he's he's like this big, bare-chested, handsome kind of, um, you know, guy, big guy and everything. And he kind of looks like he's out of, straight out of a comic book. That's the great thing about Bruce Campbell. And, yes, he is a jackass, and, yes, he is a jerk, but he is really kind of pissed off. And, and this is what I always liked about Ash. Ash is like us, you know? But he gets to be a hero, and he gets to, like, train these soldiers how to fight the Deadites. It's just fantastic. It's a wonderful, wonderful movie. Not as good as Evil Dead 2, as we know, but no, still not as good really as Evil great. Dead just, just wonderful, entertaining film. There was one thing, like, one line they changed on the director's cut that I did not like. I wish they would have kept it in. So I remember when he kills his twin Ash, and the original line in the theatrical cut was, goes, good, bad, bad. I'm the I'm guy with the gun. gun. They changed it in the director's cut to, I'm not that good. Nah, that's, that's lame. That, that is so lame and, because fucking like Duke Nukem was a video game that was out and they used that line. Good, bad. I'm the guy with the gun in it. Again, some of them. Re I'll, I will give Universal a little bit of credit. Some of them reshoots that they did were for good measure. Which ones? You were, know, uh, well, the mainly, mainly replacing that good, bad. I'm the guy with the gun. Um, you got to remember, uh, 16 minutes, I believe, was lopped out of this movie. For the theatrical cut the original cut ran 96 minutes mm -hmm. yeah and then it is a very yeah. short movie I, I remember it being a very short movie but it just sort of swings along they did i mean the way they edit they did a very good job editing i mean if they did have to cut out 16 minutes it's almost barely noticeable when you're watching it i mean the movie is still coherent yeah but i think it works better longer because there are a lot more more scenes in the movie make a little more sense with a little extra context. Right. Uh, now, we need to have a little bit of clarification here. Now, the theatrical cut is sort of it, it sort of picks up almost where Evil Dead 2 le le leaves off, except he is enslaved by um, by uh, what is it? Uh, Henry the Red's men? No, it's not Henry the Men. No, no, no. Uh, what Arthur, whatever his name is. I don't even know. If it's it was Arthur. the Arthur guy. Right. And uh, they enslave him. They're being attacked by deadites. He gets out of his chains, grabs his gun, shoots uh, shoots one of them, gets into a fight with his chainsaw and everything. So he becomes their instant savior, sort of. And uh, that's how we work our way. But we also get like a, a, a third retelling of the Evil Dead story with another new Linda, this time Bridget Fonda. 
Well, the, and in this case, though, they probably couldn't get the original actress to put in. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is they couldn't get the original actress that they used to, you know, use those scenes. I don't I don't know what the hell. You know what? Fuck what I just said. <laughs> I don't even know why you'd want to reshoot that. Why couldn't you just pick up where you left off? Well, and have I, to reshoot I, the damn maybe thing? they maybe that's part of what you were telling me about how Universal wanted it to be a movie that stood on its own. So they decided to just remake the most uh, concise part of Evil Dead for that scene at the beginning when he's explaining everything. If Universal wanted to pretend there were no Evil Dead movies before then. So give him a little bit of backstory to indicate why he's here. But, you know what? Yeah, you know, everybody you're right. You're right. Well you're right. Why, though. They, didn't they, they used, I mean, practically they reshot or reused the scene of him and the classic falling. You know, I mean, it was right there. It was right there yeah, in the movie. Yeah, so they did reuse some scenes from the Evil Dead too. but then I get what you're saying is they shot this new footage just so they could distance themselves from Even the though, original movie. I mean, Bruce Bruce obviously has a physical change going on here. He's a lot beefier, and he's a lot his he's a lot more tan. A little bit, you know. But the one thing, if you want to distance yourself from the third movie, why would you call the movie Bruce Campbell versus the Army of Darkness? I don't know. You see that 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 Maybe it's just made... fun. I mean, it's for the fans. You know, the fans always love Bruce Campbell, and they always love. Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi movies. That's why he pops up. That's why he pops up. We forgot to mention. He's the he's the last thing we see at the end of Darkman. He becomes Bruce Campbell. Yep. <laughs> you know, he bumps into Francis McDormand. Francis McDormand's looking for Liam Neeson. She can't find him. Instead, it's Bruce Campbell. And there he is. He's, and you see, what would have made more shem. sense is what would have made more sense is using Bruce Campbell for uh, Darkman's two and three. That would have been cool to see. I don't know why we didn't get that. That's weird. Because then all of a sudden, like, the main problem I also have is, like, Arnold Vosloo. I, I got to backpedal a little bit. That was one of the uh, problems I have with the sequels is that Liam Neeson's character, yeah, he's trying to do his American accent. You can't hide the brogue. But then you bring in a whole different actor who's got this South African accent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, now, granted, granted, you find out that Peyton has a gift for mimicry, okay, and that he probably changed his voice. Like, one could maybe come up with the theory that he's living this new life with this new face and he created a new voice. You could have with very him. easily had a transition where you began it with Bruce Campbell and then it became Arnold Vosloo. Right. You know, it's, uh, I wish they would have done it with Bruce Campbell. That's all I'm going to say. I don't know but what moving, he was doing moving. at the moment. I don't, I don't know. Moving back though. Yeah. Army of Darkness. I man, forgot this, to mention. Uh, oh, we forgot to mention the connection what? of Arnold Vosloo because you reminded me that he was South African. He was in uh, Steel Dawn with Patrick Swayze. And remember, we talked about Steel Dawn when we did the Patrick yeah, Swayze Yeah, we special. talked about Steel Dawn, but I, I do not remember him in Steel Dawn. He was in Steel Dawn. He was one of the one of the cast, because that movie was shot primarily in South Africa. With Makes South perfect African sense. Actors. And he was in that movie, and then guess what? Patrick Swayze's in Next of Kin with Liam Neeson. And then it all comes back to Bill Paxton. <laughs> Chet! Oh, shit! Anyway... God bless Bill Paxton once again. This this has been the season of Upstairs of Frelix where we have always consistently gone back. We've gone back to Bruce Campbell and we've gone back to Bill Paxton. And there it is. How about that? And now, apparently, Arnold Vosloo. Yeah, but then we got to go to The Mummy and we can't carry, <laughs> really carry anything over to The Mummy from these movies. I really, well, I got to say, I will say this. We did, we looked at them recently um, and these must have been like, redone in HD and everything because they look absolutely gorgeous when we saw them. We watched them on cable recently. They Incredible. I mean, they look so much better than my, than, than my DVD box set that I had from a few years ago. Oh, yeah. Ago. I mean, I got the... Uh, I have the Blu-rays of all of them, but I also have the HD DVDs because, like, just because I'm a nerd like that, I'm not even going to go into it. And by the way, <laughs> I mean, like, never watch the Mummy movies on TBS because they for some reason... Some fucking moron over there decided to take a four to three image and squeeze it to a 16 to nine. So everybody looks like really fat and really short. It Ew. is so bad. I don't know why they did that. They do that with a couple of movies when they play them on TBS because I guess they don't have the correct. The correct, the correct AR versions. or whatever the elements. Yeah, I just we just watched Jaws on Peacock today and it's fucking cropped. Oh, my God. Did they stretch it, though? Uh, it's not stretch, but it's cropped, and there's still some uh, some panning and well, at least, scanning going at on. At least, at least they didn't stretch it because these movies look terrible on TBS. They are gorgeous to look at on if you can find them on cable in HD. 
But mm. uh, back to Army of Darkness. Like I said, love this movie. Uh, I think my mom wanted to see it first. She was like, I, I really want to see this. This looks like a lot of fun. I wanted to see it when I saw the freaking TV advertisements. But, of course, couldn't see it because it's an R-rated movie. Again, it came this, out on... this is another movie. Do you, can you fathom why the hell this movie and Dark Man? We're both rated R. These are not, these are like movies for kids. Oh, wait a second. Army of Darkness deserved its R rating. Okay. I mean, there right. was a lot of the, it. Why? Uh, the prosthetics, blood. Okay, dude, the blood shooting up from the freaking well. Okay, yeah. that's an R rating. Is right it? There. I mean, is it? I mean, like, that's an R rating right there. There's only one time I think Bruce Campbell says, fuck. He's like, get the fuck out of my face. But again, it's <laughs> not, again, this is not a language situation. This is a fucking gore. And... I mean, the only thing I can come up with was the, um, the, uh, the international cut, uh, has a little bit of a sex scene with him and M. Beth Dobbins. That's about yeah. It. But then look at Evil Ash. I mean, he's got that that whole eerie looking thing about him. He's got like that fucked up face and everything like that. Yeah, but this seems all in good fun. It just seems okay. How about this? It's a tame R. It's a tame. It's a very tame. I've seen I've seen PG thirteen movies that are far more intense than this. I gotta say, especially these days. It's a very tame R. But like Evil Dead one and two, they both deserve like. In Evil Dead 2's case, lack of a rating. In Evil Dead, it's our rating. They deserve the ratings or lack of that they got. Right. But Army But of I have a feeling those R ratings could have really hurt the uh, box office. I think I think mean? they did. Oh. I think they aimed for a PG-13 and got the R instead and I think that might have messed with the box office. I don't know. They I honestly think they went into this with an R-rated movie in mind. And it's just strictly for the special effects as to why the movie gets an R. If it's you don't got, have it's them, it's got effect. decent. Uh, it's can be right. Yeah, it's can be. It's got decent uh, makeup effects. Really, uh, pretty good. But it I, does the stop motions a little wonky. It is a little uh, wonky. It's a the stop motions a little wonky. And also, you some, do get some to... of the process shots with with uh, bad Ash and good Ash are, are, are yeah. not that great. But there is a really good scene of them when they're separating and they're doing yes. this crab walk along the. Uh, that that was a pretty good shot right there, but it's it's a mixed bag. Well, I like it when the little ashes are attacking Big Ash. Yeah, but you know that's I again mean, there what are, I'm there's, to. there's some there's some goodness in that scene on the effects, but then the part where the one ash jumps into his mouth, you can just tell that looks fake as shit. It is, it is. But again, this is where this is part of that homage to old style visual effects, like that we saw in Dark Man. You know that kind of in camera stuff and the kind of mat work that they were doing. Is 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 it's a, it's a tribute to the old style of you know yeah Jason and the Argonauts is one of the movies they keep talking about yeah. you know it's obviously this, this these these movies are meant for kids they're not meant for adults they're too silly to be for adults you know maybe that's the problem right there it's they were meant for kids that like to go to the fucking movies every Friday night and just get scared for a weekend unfortunately Universal alienated themselves by calling it Army of Darkness and nobody gave a shit about it. Mm. I mean, only the pure, like, they figured, oh, yeah, we're going to take this property and make it a mainstream movie, and it's going to make money. Hell, yeah, we're not going to put the Evil Dead on it. We'll make it mainstream. People will go see it. And then what happens? You alienated people. Yeah. yeah. The only people who knew that it was an Evil Dead movie were the ones that picked up the horror movie magazines back in the day. Right. What I mean, what, and what did I tell you? I told you this a hundred times. This is where Universal really fucked up. When I saw the advertisements for Army of Darkness, I had no fucking idea it was related to the Evil Dead. And as a matter of fact, I think I told you this once before, back in the summer of 90, what is it, 97, that was the year before I could work. That was when I was renting horror movies all the time. I had saw the Evil Dead for the first time. And I was like, okay, this is a great movie. I rented Evil Dead 2. And then I'm watching it. And I'm just like, holy shit, is this the fucking Army of Darkness is the third movie? What? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yes, Universal succeeded in distancing themselves, but at the same time, they alienated people. And fuck them for that, you know? Fuck the them movie for should that. Have, the movie should have made more money. It should have been more of a franchise than it fucking became. It should have just been, like, this new big thing. But, I digress, Sam Raimi wouldn't have grown as a filmmaker had this movie failed, That's had this right. movie been successful. So at the end of the day, it's a catch 22. It is. It is. It's a catch 22. It did enable Raimi to have, to have a career, uh, after this movie. Um, well, he, 
after this movie officially he was working he was working with the Coens on Hudsucker Proxy and then he went to The Quick and the Dead and then after that you know and then he took off with a simple plan so you know yeah, he started doing more serious movies but then, then unfortunately he did Oz the Great and Powerful which I, it's unwatchable yeah, yeah, but, uh, for but, me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but hold on that that good working relationship with Disney just got him the new Doctor Strange movie that's true okay so again Sometimes you got to do that bullshit in order to keep keep your foot in the door for something else. Play ball with Disney. Maybe we can do something else down the line. Yeah, that's true. But and I, and, I and thank I God for that, dude. For Oz, though. <laughs> I I I'm glad I never saw it, dude. I had no interest. I'm it's... sorry. There's there's, dude. Even Return to Oz to me is a hard movie to sit through. Well, well, but that's a cult classic. I I know it's a cult classic. I think my wife talked about that through. one. I mean, there is only one Wizard of Oz, and anybody who tries to make a sequel or prequel, it's kind of sacrilege. I don't think anybody would cast Mila Kunis. Uh. <laughs> I mean, she's <laughs> she's gorgeous and everything, but that voice, no, sorry. She has that Valley Girl voice. I know, that, right? You know? Like, I like, know, I'm right? so stupid guy. Uh, <laughs> all right, we should probably wrap this up, man. It's getting late. I got to do, uh, yeah. I gotta do the fams. Uh, um, so, well, I'll do final thoughts for me. Army of Darkness. Love it. It's a great movie. Classic, beautiful, wonderful. Love it. It has the same place in my heart for, with dark man. It's just part of that whole naive, innocent, boyish charm of Sam Raimi, just trying to entertain people. And they had to do it. And it was a lot harder back then. And you, I'd, I'd say this is the last, like really pure, Sam Raimi movie before he started becoming serious. But then you could also, one could also argue drag me to hell is like a return, but it yeah. was funny. I was not a fan of that movie. Um, I need to watch it again. I watched it a while back because we're fans of Alice and Loman here. So we I to saw it again. in the theater. Okay. And I, even though it was rated PG 13, I was like, dude, it's a Sam Raimi horror movie. I gotta go see it. I remember walking out. I'm like, I do not hate this movie. But there was, like, I never wanted to watch it again, dude. And I have not seen it since the theater. So I honestly think if you want to get, if you want to know what kind of filmmaker Sam Raimi was before he started doing all that, all the big budget shit and all the art house shit he did, watch Army of Darkness. Or fucking watch Dark Man. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, know, know what he was all about before he started, with the, before the money came in. Yeah. Before all the decisions were lifted out of his hand, and it became more corporatized at that time. At that time, too. Well, but at the same you know, time, I gotta say, well, first, well, there is a movie that he made that was a small, smallish personal movie, and it was The Gift, written by Billy Bob Thornton and starring uh, Kate Blanchett. It was a, it was a fine movie. I really enjoyed it quite a bit. It's a very, it's a very good movie. I think a simple plan is better. Mm -hmm. The The Gift, I will give it this. It had a hell of a twist ending. Like, you, when you found out who the killer was, you were kind of taken aback a little bit. Yeah. Like, like what was funny with me is I hadn't seen The Gift in forever. Spoiler alert, it's Greg Kinnear. Um, I totally forgot it was Greg Kinnear. The movie actually had me convinced for a while. I know. That, yeah, that somebody else <laughs> did it. And even though I'd already seen it before, I'll give that to Sam Raimi and Billy Bob for that one. That, I mean, they took what could have been a simple movie, but then they made it a lot better. They had There was some really good casting. Now, you talk about... Um, in this case, an Australian actress who's really good at mimicking American or doing that 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 down home Southern accent, Kate Blanchett, dude. Yes, like for you look at her. I love Kate. In this she's movie a great. And she's great. She's great. You in would not think she's an Aussie, dude. You would not think in a million years she's a fucking Aussie. Yeah. But yeah, man, that's a great movie. So is a simple plan. I mean, Sam Raimi's one hell of a filmmaker. Fucking Crime Wave and For Love of the Game, though, man. <laughs> Two movies, and and in your case, Oz the Great and Powerful, and to an even other extent, Spider Man Three. Those are the movies to to avoid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, possibly. <laughs> Anything else though? Go nuts, have fun, All right. watch those movies. So, but uh, next time, I think, aren't we doing? Uh, aren't we doing Kiss? I don't know if we're doing Kiss. We're no, we're doing uh, Army of the Dead. Oh, we gotta God. talk about that fucking movie, and I'm gonna. I'm going to beat the shit out of you intellectually on that one. Oh, God. So if My you want to not... see that, if you want to see me and Freilich square off, just remember, I'm 6'2", and I'm, I'm, I've been on my exercise bike at least an hour every day. And I'm 5'11", and I'm just going to give you a butt helmet. Okay. <laughs> oh, Jesus. 
Like, share, and subscribe. We'll find out. I'll find out later what a butt helmet is. Later's. Later, Gators.